shows tonight for the first time. Vice President Dick Cheney acknowledges that his daughter is gay. His personal views on gay marriage differ from administration policy. A new report says Pentagon brass should have done more to stop prisoner abuse in Iraq. The report calls it Animal House on the Night Shift. Important news for anyone who drinks sugared sodas. They increase the risk of getting diabetes by 80% in women. And the art heist. Stealing masterpieces is far more common than you might think. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Reporting tonight, Charles Gibson. Good evening. We start tonight with the most powerful politician in American history to acknowledge that he has a child who is gay. Vice President Dick Cheney did just that today when asked his thoughts on gay marriage. As he answered the question, the vice president expressed a position on gay marriage fundamentally different from the policy that President Bush has laid out for the administration. Here's ABC's Claire Shipman. The issue came in a campaign town hall meeting where the questions are not usually this pointed. I need to know, what do you think about homosexual marriages? Lynn and I have a gay daughter. Um, so it's an issue that our family is very familiar with. Uh, we have two daughters and we uh, have enormous pride in both of them. It's the first time the vice president has ever publicly addressed the fact that his daughter, Mary, who helps to run his campaign, is gay, although she herself has been open about it. With respect to the question of uh, ra relationships, my general view is that uh, freedom means freedom for everyone. As In February, President Bush proposed a constitutional amendment that would ban same-sex marriage. Today, I call upon the Congress to promptly pass an amendment to our Constitution defining and protecting marriage as a union of a man and woman. Since then, the vice president has been in a difficult position. In 2000, he said the issue of gay marriage should be left up to the states. And the vice president doesn't like to publicize his differences with the president. And do you support it? I support the president. Today, however, he made plain that his view is different than the president's. That's appropriately a matter for the states to decide that that's, uh, that's how it ought to best be handled. At this point, uh, say my own preference uh, is as I've stated, but uh, the president makes basic policy for the administration. It was already promising to be a thorny issue during the Republican convention, and today conservative Republicans said they were disappointed in the vice president's comments. The vice president's remarks today are disappointing. Uh, the fact is, I think it sends a very mixed message to voters. Where does the administration stand on this issue? Historically, that's but gay Republican groups welcome the move. It was a, a break uh, with the president, and it reminds all of us why the Republican Party ought not to divide this country. Tonight, the Cheney campaign says the vice president's comments are not markedly different from anything he said in the past. The White House also trying to downplay it, noting the vice president made the president's position plain. But what is notable here, Charlie, is that six days before a carefully crafted, well-organized Republican convention, the vice president obviously decided that the personal was more important than the political. All right, Claire Shipman reporting from Washington. Thanks. On the Democratic side, Senator John Kerry was in New York City today with people in his campaign talking about trying to change the emphasis from the debate over his service in Vietnam to issues of policy. Mr. Kerry ended up giving a speech about both, and he accused the Bush campaign and its allies of using the tactics of fear and smear. ABC's Dan Harris covers the Kerry campaign for us. Just six days before the Republican convention begins here, John Kerry came to New York City to accuse the president, this time indirectly, of being behind Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, a group of anti-Kerry veterans running TV ads. My duty is to be a president who tells the truth instead of hiding behind front groups, saying anything and doing anything to avoid the real issues that matter. The Bush campaign has repeatedly denied any link to the group and today pointed out that it is Kerry who has attacked the president's service record. This comes from a president who can't even show or prove that he showed up for duty in the National Guard. They uh, try to present themselves as victims here, and that's just simply not the case at the hand of this campaign, this administration, or this president. Kerry's visit to New York had two other purposes, to try to preempt the Republican convention by dismissing it as a parade of, quote, empty slogans before it even begins, 
and to try to refocus the campaign debate away from the current controversy. While many of the claims from the anti-carry veterans have been discredited, they have dominated the news for weeks, distracting attention away from the issues on which the Kerry campaign thinks it can win, such as health care and the economy. Should we continue a failed fiscal policy that says to middle-class families, tax cuts for Halliburton and Enron and those who make more than $200,000 a year are more important than tax cuts for you? But Senator Kerry cannot easily walk away from this discussion over his past. He is the one who made his Vietnam War record a central pillar of his campaign. Dan Harris, ABC News, New York. Another major story today, an independent panel appointed by the Pentagon released its report today on the abuse scandal at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. The panel, led by former Defense Secretary James Schlesinger, said there was widespread chaos at the prison. And the panel was very specific about who is to blame. ABC's Martha Raddatz has this report from the Pentagon. The independent panel said responsibility for the abuse at Abu Ghraib reached the highest levels of the Pentagon. We believe that there is institutional and personal responsibility right up the chain of command as far as Washington is concerned. The Pentagon failed to properly adapt to the situation on the ground and to provide sufficient number of adequately organized and trained personnel needed to conduct detention operations in Iraq. The panel even cited poor post-war planning by the civilian and military leadership as a contributor to the abuse, singling out Joint Chiefs Chairman Richard Myers and then Commander Tommy Franks. The Joint Chiefs of Staff and the commander of U.S. Central Command failed to develop a war plan to include effective alternatives to post-major combat operations. The panel placed most of the blame for the abuse on the military, including Lieutenant General Ricardo Sanchez, who was the U.S. commander in Iraq at the time. The panel said Sanchez created a command structure that resembled a labyrinth of confusion. That confusion and lack of leadership exercised by the top commander set a poor example for subordinates to follow. The panel found that weak and ineffectual leadership by Brigadier General Janice Karpinski, who headed the Military Police Brigade, and Colonel Thomas Pappas, head of the Military Intelligence Brigade, allowed the abuses at Abu Ghraib. But the panel said none of the horrendous abuse in the now famous photograph was sanctioned by official policy. There was sadism on the night shift at Abu Ghraib sadism that was certainly not authorized. It was kind of animal house on the night shift. Donald Rumsfeld was spared any harsh criticism, Charlie, in this report. Tomorrow, another report, an Army report, and several new individuals are expected to be named who are believed responsible for the abuse. Arthur Raddatz, thanks very much. To Iraq now and the three-week siege in Najaf. U.S. forces today surrounded the Holy Shrine, where rebel fighters loyal to the cleric Muqtada al-Sadr remain holed up. Some U.S. troops are within 400 yards of the front door. And U.S. warplanes pounded the city for a fourth night in a row. Earlier, the Iraqi defense minister warned the cleric's fighters that the decisive hours are near. At the U.S. military prison in Cuba, a new chapter in the war on terror opened today. Pre-trial hearings began for the suspected terrorists and Taliban fighters being held at Guantanamo Bay. Today's hearing involved a man accused of being Osama bin Laden's driver and bodyguard. It was the first U.S. military tribunal of its kind since the end of World War II. Hearings for three other defendants begin later this week. In Athens today, the magical run for the Iraqi soccer team ended with a 3-1 loss to Paraguay in the semifinals. Iraq can still win the bronze if it beats Italy on Friday. And Hungarian Robert Fazekas was stripped of his gold medal in the discus after he failed to provide a drug test sample. He was the second athlete in two days to lose a gold medal over questions about doping. It seems now that there's a judging controversy at every Olympics, but in Athens, it's beginning to seem as if there's a new one every day. The Paul Hom gymnastics controversy is well known, but now there are a whole host of gymnasts complaining about the judges. Here's ABC's Bob Woodruff in Athens. According to his brother, Paul Hom had considered giving up his disputed gold medal this week until he noticed on videotape that Korean Yang Tae Young made what he felt was an additional mistake. He could have actually been in fourth place, and you know, that is why we don't have video review. 
Since the Ham controversy last week, the door has been open to an increasing number of judging complaints. Russian gymnast Svetlana Korkina now says she deserved a higher score and should have won the all-around gold. The Greeks and Bulgarians have protested, and Canadian Kyle Schufeld says he was robbed of a bronze. Basically, I landed both my vaults and did pretty good, and the Romanian gymnast just he fell on his second vault. So the scores that he was given from the judges were mathematically impossible. And last night, after the popular Russian Alexei Nemov received a surprisingly low score, the fans lost patience. This is amazing. For 10 minutes, the competition stopped until the judges raised his score, claiming there had been a mistake. The Russians protested this event, too. Gymnastics used to be seen as the sport, you could, the judge sport that you could trust. Figure skating was a sport that was the butt of all jokes, and, and gymnastics was, well, you know, it's, they do a pretty good job. Well, now we're seeing gymnastics exposed in a way we've never have before. Some gymnastics observers believe that all these new complaints may ultimately help Paul Hom keep his controversial gold. It would have been easy to change the medals in one event, but with so many now in dispute, gymnastics officials are more likely to hold a hard line. Bob Woodruff, ABC News, Athens. And when we come back, the brazen theft of priceless works of art. Where do the stolen masterpieces end up? We'll take a closer look. The new study about the potential dangers of too many sugar-sweetened soft drinks. There is a significant risk of developing diabetes. And the unlikely relationship between beetles and barbells. Incredible athletes, not in Athens. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Brought to you by Viagra. We're going to take a closer look tonight inside the murky world of international art thieves. The theft of Edvard Munch's The Scream this week, one of the most recognizable paintings in the world, was only the latest in a series of high-profile heists. The Art Loss Register, a group that tracks stolen art, says up to 150,000 objects of great art are currently missing. So the questions, why is art theft so easy and where does the stolen art end up? ABC's David Wright takes a closer look. Today, the most powerful image of despair at Oslo's Munch Museum was the look on tourists' faces. They were stolen. Really? <gasps> Two of Munch's masterpieces stolen by masked gunmen so clumsy they dropped the paintings twice as they made their getaway. It's now Thomas Cran dashing around in fantastic Savile Row suits, um, stealing beautiful pictures in a very elegant way. Um, but the motivation does tend to be purely money-driven. Five and a half billion dollars worth of art has been stolen just in the past century. Among the works that are still missing, nearly 200 Rembrandts, nearly 300 Chagalls, and nearly 500 Picassos. Interpol circulates a regular list of the world's most wanted art, but catching the crooks can take decades because famous paintings are tough to sell. This $30 million Cezanne was stolen in 1978. When a Russian syndicate eventually tried to sell it, the painting popped up in a database and was returned to its rightful owner 21 years after the theft. There's clearly a black market in stolen art, but art investigators say buyer beware. Often the thieves make forgeries of the works they steal. They tell you buy, is, you have to buy because it's stolen and you will pay less. Eh? And actually is a forgery. Another possibility, the thieves try to ransom stolen paintings for the insurance money. Not an option in Norway. Like many museums, their policy doesn't cover theft. The premiums would be too pricey, and the works are irreplaceable anyway. This theft is a kind of a wake-up call to the museums around the world, galleries around the world, but also the art insurance industry. A wake-up to museum security experts, too. At the Louvre, the Mona Lisa sits behind bulletproof glass, but that's the exception. In most galleries, the artwork is more exposed to the tourists and the art thieves. David Wright, ABC News, Rome. Our closer look for tonight. When we come back, the American thirst for soft drinks, a study suggesting it's causing an increase in diabetes. 
tomorrow, the taser gun. More and more police forces are using it. It's supposed to be a safer alternative. But are they deadly? Plus, think these boxers are good? See who's really packing the world's strongest punch. Watch World News Tonight. There is a new study being published tomorrow that links soft drinks and diabetes. The study found that people who have at least one sugar-sweetened drink a day are likely to gain weight and increase their risk of diabetes. The study in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that soft drink consumption by adults rose 61% between 1977 and 1997. The rate of type 2, or adult-onset diabetes, followed a similar pattern. Here's ABC's John McKenzie. Americans get more processed sugar from soft drinks than from any other source. Just one Coke or Pepsi or 7-Up contains almost as much sugar as two Hershey bars. Indeed, some nutritionists refer to sodas as liquid candy. And every time you drink one of those, you're consuming an ounce and a half of sugar. It's like taking a glucose tolerance test right there every single time you, you drink one. The study out tonight followed more than 90,000 women over an eight-year period. Researchers found that women who drank one or more sugar-sweetened soft drinks a day gained on average 17 pounds more than women who drank only one soda a week. This is not a coincidence. We took into account differences in physical activity, other dietary factors, and we still see a strong link between a consumption of sugared beverages and weight gain. We believe this is a cause and effect relation. Even more troubling, the study found that women who drank one or more sugar-sweetened drinks a day had an 83% greater risk of developing diabetes compared to those who drank just one a month. Being overweight is the prime cause.